on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We preview Bedlam with our man Robert Allen. We also preview the best games of Week 12 in college football, and we finish up giving you our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, November 16th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about Riverwind's gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of November, all you got to do is visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now recording this Wednesday morning, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Ted, it's Bedlam week, baby. Let's go. Bedlam week, excited, night game. It's going to be cold as I feel like all Bedlams have been for the last, I don't know, decade or more, it feels like. Um, I'm excited about this one. This is for, for different reasons. There's a lot on the line in this game, right? Uh, it's not. It's not Big 12 championships, uh, college football playoff appearances like we had hoped, but there, there's going to be a lot on the line. This is a big one for Oklahoma. There's going to be a bunch of big-time recruits in town. I, we're 5-5. Five and five. We're knocking on the door of a, of a losing season, perhaps. Like this is, this is an important game. Yeah, I, I know there are some people out there. They're like, oh, this bedlam doesn't mean anything. Listen, man, they all mean something. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I I can tell you, you know, went three and one in Bedlam that year we lost. I heard it from everyone, right? Like, it, let me tell you, it means something. I don't, I don't want to have to go a full calendar year, another full calendar year of having to hear stuff from Oklahoma state fans. Okay. So yeah. to say it doesn't mean anything is just flat out wrong. And I, 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 yeah, I, I would almost say that this one means is more important than last year's. And last year we had a chance to go to the Big 12 championship had we won, right? And who knows what happens after that? Like it's it's on the opposite end of the spectrum, but like the fallout from this game, if you don't win it, is catastrophic i mean oklahoma state fans are already making fun of us right. we can't let them win this game we j- just can't it. happen so th- there is a lot on the line remember we live amongst these people uh, that that's what makes it different than ou texas in my mind is like this is this is for bragging rights in every day like your day-to-day life whether you're a player or a coach or just a fan whatever this is for bragging rights in your day-to-day life here in the state of Oklahoma. No doubt. And I, I don't want to hear that there's nothing on the line, man. That's a lot. That means a lot to me. This, this game and what happens, the result of this game, shapes my happiness here in <laughs> Oklahoma. It shouldn't, it shouldn't matter as much as it does, Ted, but it does. So yeah. I am I, I just can't get on board with some people. Oh, this is meaningless. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That is. That's not how we're looking at this game. This thing means something. It's important. I know it's important to me and you. That's for yep. damn sure. Totally agree. And I I know that there there is not going to be any players or coaches that – well, I guess I can't say – there may be some players at this point in the season that have checked out that, you know, haven't played and maybe they're transfer portal guys like – there may be a handful of guys that this doesn't mean anything to, but they're not going to be playing. 
And it, I can guarantee you there's not a coach up there that feels that way. So this is um, this is going to be a big one, and, and I actually think it's going to be a great football game. So do I. All right, let's get into it. Now you had uh, Brent Venable's coach's show earlier in the week. Anything he said that really stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of really good things to say. Um, one of the things that stood out, though, was – the official told him on the field that his knee wasn't down. That's why they picked up the, the flag. And that just infuriates the hell out of me because it doesn't even matter if his knee was down or not. The player's giving himself up. You know, if his knee's not down, then it should have been a targeting. So you're, right. you're talking about the CJ Colden interception yep. in the end zone against West Virginia, jump off sides, intercept it. And they picked up the personal foul just in case anyone's confused. Yeah. So that makes me really mad that they said that because number one, like, like I said, it doesn't matter, but like, you can't, how can you, how can you pick up? I've seen it a bunch of times and I'm still not really sure if it was up or if it was down whenever I, uh, you, you can't pick a flag up like that. If one guy calls it and you're not going to review it, to come in and overturn it or, or to pick up that flag. I don't know. Now here's the thing. That's not an excuse. Do we automatically win the game? If that penalty sticks? No, but it's definitely a big play in that game. And we have a hard enough time right now winning games. I on our own against the other team. The last thing we need is terrible calls in a, very important moments in the game that go against us. Frustrating. Yeah, it's just, it kind of feels like that's just how the season has gone yeah. for Oklahoma. It feels feels pretty par for the course. But, all right, let's jump into Bedlam, man. Uh, let's start with Oklahoma's defense, Oklahoma State's offense. What are you watching for, Ted? What challenges does Oklahoma State's offense present? Well, all that matters. Uh, you know, uh, on who's playing quarterback. They're, they're a different animal when Spencer Sanders is back there just because of his playmaking ability. He's, he's so much better in the run game um, than, the, than Rangel and, and Gundy. He's, 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 you know, as much experience as he has, he's just a playmaker. He kind of knows how to get things done whenever he's in scramble drill or, you know, knows who to go to quickly and, you know, if he's got to throw hot, knows who to trust and where to go, understands the protection, just has a, such a better command of the offense. Um, but still, whenever he's out there, I still think Oklahoma State's offense is really limited. They've, they've struggled running the football. Now, whether that's injury-related up front on the offensive line or, um, you know, they've just kind of stagnated a little bit in the running game, I'm not exactly sure. But I, you're not going to get – yeah. I can jump in there. Their offensive line is not good. Yeah. Uh, particularly at offensive tackle. I think Caleb Etienne, like he should not be playing. 76, their left tackle. And, you know, I got to believe that they don't have a better option, which is, which is hard to believe when you watch their offensive tackles on tape. Like I, we've grown accustomed to Oklahoma state having a solid offensive line, right? This is, this is the worst Oklahoma state offensive line I can remember. And I'll just yeah. say it. If Ethan Downs and Reggie Grimes and R. Mason Thomas, if they can't get after this group of offensive tackles, then I, I'm going to be really, really disappointed because they stink at offensive tackle. Not They're not average. They're not okay. They're bad. Straight yeah. up bad. It's hard to watch. So the edge players for OU better have themselves a day because those guys stink. Yeah. Which, you know, it, it had me wondering what what we major in on the defensive line, if we're going to major in a, a four-man front or a, a three-man front. You know, we did a lot of four-man stuff against West Virginia. You know, at times, you know, big stretches of that game, it worked really well. We had a bunch of tackles for loss. And, you know, whenever I watched that Iowa State game, Iowa State's D-line penetrated and pushed the pile, and they had a huge game. So, I, I agree. I think that I think we should have a, a a pretty good day on the 
on the defensive line controlling the the line of scrimmage, you're not going to see a whole lot of wild stuff from them. You're going to get some unbalanced, you know, and that's kind of something Oklahoma State's always always done quite a bit of some pin pull stuff, standard split zone. They even run uh, the reverse split zone where the the H back behind the line of scrimmage goes to the tight end side, which is really weird. I've seen it before. No one ever has any success with it. I don't know why people continue to do it. Uh, they'll do some toss stuff. Uh, they'll toss it like out of shotgun with the back offset and, you know, do some crack or pin pull stuff. Um, you know, we got, we got a bunch of counter from West Virginia, right? And I, I, You haven't seen a whole lot of that from Oklahoma State, but as we know, you know, we saw West Virginia run some of the the bunch and inside zone and counter off of it, just like we saw Baylor do. Oklahoma State's going to do the same thing. They're going to run a little bit of stretch. They're going to run some bunch, crack toss, and they're going to run some counter off of it to see if if we figured out those fits a little bit better. Uh, Passing game really standard again it it's a little bit different whenever they've got one of the younger guys in as compared when spencer sanders is in um you get a lot of spacing routes which are quick easy throws um you know the the big explosive play they had against iowa state the 83 yarder was a will route uh same spacing concept across the board but the slot receiver runs a will route as they isolate him on uh you know that that what we would have is the cheetah position and just throw a perfect ball to him for 83 yard touchdown. Um, you know, some stuff right there at the line of scrimmage, some quick, easy hitters to like swing screens to running backs or bubbles and tunnels. They'll do some of that for easy completions, but it's really a, a pretty, like, I don't mean it in a derogatory sense, but like they're basic, they don't do a whole lot of, of wild stuff. And you know, I I think it's it's made it more difficult because they could do that and get away with it when they had the best defense in school history a year ago, and it was a different animal. And their defense, I think, is still solid, but it's just it's totally different whenever they're three and out and, and turning people over, just you know, left and right. So, um, just like West Virginia, defensively, I feel I feel confident that we should have a strong outing. Now, can we do it for four quarters? Can can the offense and special teams take advantage of of the stops and turnovers that the defense happens to get? I don't know, but I feel like they should be able to have a strong performance. Yeah, the uh, I would say the biggest difference for Oklahoma State offensively this year is they're back to the hyper tempo, right? Snapping it. So you, you mentioned keeping it pretty simple offensively with the pace that they play with kind of have to do that. You can't get too complex with how quickly they're snapping the football. The one thing I will say that stands out to me when you watch them on tape is Spencer Sanders, pretty dang good, man. Like when it comes to throwing the football, it seems like he's seeing coverage clearly seems like how he, he has a good understanding of how to move defenses with his eyes to set up throwing lanes. Like, he he plays like a guy that's played a ton of football yep. and he, he's done a, he's done a good job, especially. And I got a, I got a lot of respect for him playing through whatever it's like collarbone shoulder on the throwing on the throwing arm. Like he's shown some toughness. Like I've been, I've been impressed with him. I really have. Yep. No, it's a, it's a totally different offense whenever he's out there, which, you know, I'm not, advocating for anyone to do anything uh against the rules but this is the thing that's why you got to get after the quarterback right whenever he decides to scramble or you get a, a an opportunity to put a shot on him within the rules you got to do it all right because that's a big factor there's a bunch of guys that are playing football that are limping around out there and you know you you when, when they're as important as as he is to that team you like that's why you play physical football right so um, that'll be a big, big deciding factor. If he's able to play all four quarters and, you know, he's somewhat healthy, it's going to be a much bigger challenge. Yeah. All right. Anything else? OU's defense versus Oklahoma State's offense? I don't think so. 
All right, let's talk some OU offense versus the Oklahoma State defense. And Oklahoma State's defense isn't as bad. Like, they don't look as bad as they are statistically when you watch them on tape. And, yeah, they've had they've had issues in the secondary. There's no doubt about it. Some inexperience back there. Uh, had some communication problems. But as a as a group, I I really don't think they're that bad. And one of the reasons I don't think they're that bad is like it's still a very physical group defensively for them. Like they they're tough. They'll hit you. I, I mean, it's it's clearly it's not last year's group. It's not even close. But it, it's not a terrible defense overall. Uh, the first thing, Oklahoma's offensive line has to play well because. Oklahoma State, they've got a lot of guys that play along that defensive front, and, and we'll see if if Tyler Lacey's able to go. Uh, we'll talk to our buddy Robert Allen about that, but, you know, no trace forward. But they've, they've got guys that have played a ton of football along that defensive front, and, and they're tough. They're physical. They play with solid technique. You know, they're going to be in that four-down look, and – if you don't match and exceed the physicality that they're bringing, you know, no matter what run game you dial up, you, you got to win the physical fight at the line of scrimmage. So, you know, that that's the first thing. And we'll, we'll see what Andrew Rame's status looks like for the game. I, I kind of got the sense that, you know, that shoulder just kind of stopped working in, in the West Virginia game. And anyone that's ever had, that it, it's a weird, weird feeling. Like it's not necessarily painful. It just like you, everything's not firing the way it's supposed to be, be firing. So we'll, we'll see if he's able to go at center. And if he's not, then obviously you slide Conjol in and you just, you do what you do. But I am interested to see how Oklahoma state plays OU's counter stuff, right? Some of the counter stuff has been really, really successful, whether that's the GT counter to the tight end away from the tight end, the G Y or G F, whatever you want to call Braden Willis and those, on those plays uh, that that stuff's been good, but you know, early in the Texas game, they were, they were boxing it Ted out on the edge and they were getting gashed. And then they started spilling it and played it much better. So I'm interested to see what technique they play on that kickout puller early in the game and kind of the space that that Oklahoma can find in those concepts. But I, I continue to think that edge runs are are the best course of action for Oklahoma offensively. We we've seen them run it well. Uh, we've seen them attack the edge as well. So I I still think that's the way to go. Yeah. I, and I think that they should have a, a ton of success in the running game. And I know that Oklahoma State's got a, a good physical front. And, yeah, I, I, we've been putting out around 230 yards a game on the ground. I expect it to to be about the same. And I expect the workload for Eric Gray to continue to increase. I think the last three games – what he went 20 carries 20 carries and what do you have like 25 26 I think against West Virginia and like th near 30 touches overall I think that's going to continue to happen like he's he's their best most consistent weapon right now offensively so I, I think the running game is going to be there and if it's there it's going to open up the shots downfield can we take advantage of them I mean that's that's kind of the whole story right uh, speaking of those shots downfield, I think you attack two and three. It's easy to remember people attack two and three, Corey Black and Cam Smith. I, I think those are, those are the weaknesses when it comes to covering in the back end of that Oklahoma state defense. I would avoid Jason Taylor. That guy's a baller. He's a, he, I mean, he's a really good player and I'm interested to see now that Jabbar Muhammad's back at corner for this game. I wonder if they're going to travel him with Mims. Uh, he's clearly, he's their best cover guy. Guy plays with a ton of confidence. He's been, been pretty damn impressive on tape, but they've had to move him around to, to fill some voids due to injury. But I think he'll be back to playing true corner in this game. And I wonder if they travel him with Mims. So they'll, I, I would, if I was Oklahoma state, I I'd want, I'd want that matchup all game long if I were them. Yeah. 
You know, it's interesting. I, a lot of times when you, when you travel a corner with a specific player, it can be, it can almost be easier offensively to get a better matchup with, you know, running stacks with wide receivers to where they have to zone it off or, you know, putting a guy, putting him in motion across the formation. So they'll have a plan for that. If, if they do try and isolate him, look for them to start moving Mims a little bit, getting some stacks, forcing Oklahoma state to have to zone it off and switch it off on some releases. Yeah. As far as the pass game, you, you mentioned, Hey, feed Eric gray running the football and I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, that's going to be a big part of the game plan. I do think he can have a big game catching the ball out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. I do. As I watch that defense, I do not think their linebackers, Benson and, and Cobb, I don't think they cover very well. And they need to find ways to get Eric Gray, the ball in space in the passing game. And whether that's the swing screen stuff where those guys have to fight through all the trash, uh, whether that's some angle routes in the middle of the field, like Deuce Vaughn. And, you know, when, when you're comparing guys to Deuce Vaughn and Bijan Robinson, that's that, you know, that's a pretty lofty comparison, but I, I think Eric Gray's in that conversation, man. I, Production wise, he's there, right? He's definitely there. Now he's different than those guys clearly, but they both had really big days catching the football against this defense. And it's because the offensive coordinators found ways to isolate them on those inside backers in the passing game. Yeah. And I, I assume, I know if I see it, Levy sees it, right? So how, wh when they do some of that stuff, like how explosive of plays result from that? Because I, I do think there are opportunities to get Eric Gray the football in the passing game. And man, it would, it would be nice to get some easy chunks just throwing it to zero in this one. Yeah. And uh, that reminded me of something that Venable said at Rudy's. And I believe I've got this right. He, Eric Gray, did, did he take over the lead in rushing in the Big 12? That's, I'm pretty sure that's what BV said. Yeah. And he said that and what he's at 1,100 yards. He's, it's the fastest to 1100 yards at the university of Oklahoma since Adrian Peterson in 2004. That's pretty impressive. So that's, um, that's kind of the numbers he's, he's throwing out there right now, which, you know, his last is his, his last four games. He's just been on a, like a rocket ship up and hopefully that continues, but I do agree. Like some of the, we haven't seen the angle and option routes out of him much recently, but, we did. They did try the swing stuff a couple of times against West Virginia. It didn't turn out good, but I I totally agree with you. And you know, it you, it can kind of build off of like what we were saying about Mims. Like if they're if they're traveling their best guy with him, like you can create some of those bunch formations where they have to zone it off. And a lot of times, the swing off of that or the angle off of that is really dangerous. Uh, because typically, like if you're playing man, you zone it off and play cover four to that side. And it can really stress the inside backers on who do you have? Do you stay with it? it the call's got to be quick because everyone motions to it. They don't just line up and let you you talk it out first. So that could definitely, I could see that being a, a big weapon for sure. Yeah. So Eric Gray is third in the big 12 in yards per game he is number one in yards per rush gotcha so not uh not too shabby if you're going to lead in a statistic that's that's the one you want to lead in is yards per rush so that is yeah that's a good sign uh, i'm sure that they'll they'll run it quite a bit against that oklahoma state defense a uh, couple more things uh, mason cobb zero uh, one of their inside backers He's a really good feel for what I call green dogging, uh, whether you want to call it delay rush. I know you've used the term hug rush in the past, Ted, but Dylan Gabriel is going to have to be aware of him coming later on a blitz. Whatever term you want to use, 
he's he's got a nice feel for it. And, and sometimes it's just okay. Let's see. Is the is the back blocking? Then I trigger. Sometimes it's it, he just seems like he does it because he sees the space and he feels it. But the offensive line needs to keep an eye on him. If he is in the protection count, you cannot just glance and say, "Okay, he's we're good." Right? He is. He's got a. He's got just a natural feel for when to add to the rush. That's good, and that is a, an extremely dangerous um, ability that that a good backer has. And sometimes it takes a while to figure out, like, ah, oh, I've just got this guy man to man, but by where I line up, I can manipulate the the protection. And even if I can just appear that I've got him man to man or appear that I'm blitzing and have them count me and I can get my guys and uh, maybe an extra count for a one on one before they you know, pick up that I'm not coming or I can uh, I can come late. Yeah, that's when, when linebackers are good at that. It's dangerous because there's almost no right way to block it. Right. Because they can insert at, at right places and you know, just kind of play that poker game with you. So yeah, that's, that's something where, you know, you've talked about it before. Like even whenever you're helping on a guy, you still have to be, you're helping here, but you're looking somewhere else to see if someone's coming late. So yeah, communication, eyes. Eye discipline is key. One last thing, and this is, this really is not a name that, you know, you're going to hear a lot of people talk about when it comes to Oklahoma State's defense, but just with some of the interior guys we've seen Oklahoma's interior offensive line struggle with this season, I'm a little worried about number 92, Nathan Latou. He He's played some more snaps here lately, and his length could be an issue for Oklahoma's guards. Uh, I think that long-limbed guy who appears to be getting better, plays with a lot of energy. I think that he's got some juice as an interior pass rusher. So I've got my eye on 92. Uh, I'm hoping that Oklahoma's interior offensive line can, can handle him without any issues, but he's got the same physical profile that that Oklahoma's interior has struggled with when it comes to some of these other matchups in the conference, you know, thinking 95 from Baylor, Gabe Hall, guys that are, you know, tall, long arm guys that they can use the length and keep Chris Murray and Matoyer uh, who are not long arm guys uh, away from their body. So that's just one thing. Like as I watched him, as I watched the Iowa state game, watched some stuff here recently, I was like, who the hell is 92? I don't like it. So that's just, that's, that's one one little detail that kind of stood out to me as I watched this defense. Yeah. Well, they've got a talented uh, defensive line and you're right. I mean, you've pointed it out several times that length on the inside uh, over our guards has been an issue and we've had a bunch of passes batted down and, and, you know, it's, it's been hard at times for us to get movement at those spots. Um, you know, Murray's a, a bulldozer until he goes up against the guy with the long arms right it's it's you know one of his physical limitations but got to get it done absolutely no excuses got to get it done all right let's move on to call your shot we asked you guys your boldest prediction for bedlam and <laughs> you're gonna love this first response it comes from at tally Oki on twitter who says a record number of four letter words on your post game recap podcast. Yeah. Let's hope, you know, that can go both ways. Hopefully the record is because I'm just blown away with how good the, the uh, performance was on Saturday. You know, that's, that's, that's a possibility. We can't just eliminate that, but let's hope not. Let's hope it's, a, let's hope it's just the cleanest version we've ever had. That would be, yeah, let's hope that the four-letter words are just celebratory. You know, that's that's what we're hoping for. But yeah, that's that's pretty pretty funny because you want them all to have a yeah after them. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. And we are fully aware that we've been a little on edge lately. And I 
I just think that is, it's just us being ourselves, but it also, I think it's pretty reflective of how the fan base feels as well. So yeah. we're, yeah. we're not going to apologize for that. We understand a lot of people listen with their kids. We get that, but yeah, there's just been some, uh, some frustration lately. That's just, uh, that's just kind of where things have been with the way that the season has gone. Uh, okay. This last one comes from at clay Thomas Connor one. Uh, Boomer Bowtie is what he calls himself. He says his boldest prediction is, oh, you actually plays a game without shooting itself in the foot multiple times. That's a lot to ask, man. This team has had a gift for it. So he's saying we win by two scores. All right. That's, I mean, that's what would happen. If, if OU plays a clean game, they play efficiently, offensively, defensively, special teams. They've got a more talented team than Oklahoma State. Um, if you value the football, you take care of it. Yeah, you win. But that is – complimentary football has just – has not been happening. It just hadn't yep. been happening. So I, I hope our man Boomer Bowtie is right. That would be awfully nice. Yeah. And it seems really simple. Catch the, catch the layup touchdowns. Don't penalize yourself with procedure stuff, you know, run the route behind the line of scrimmage, um, you know, keep the hands off the face mask on a sack. That's going to make it, you know, third in a million, you know, stay on sides on fourth and 15, make your field goals. I, you do those things. You walk out of West Virginia, probably winning by 20 points, but you don't do them. You walk out of there with a big L. It's going to be the same exact situation at home against Oklahoma State. Yeah, and you can go back and listen to the recap of the Baylor game if you'd like to know other things that they shouldn't do. <laughs> so it's been a couple games here in a row where the the mistakes, right, shooting yourself in the foot has added up for this football team. All right, let's get to our birthday shout-outs. Happy fifth birthday to Blakely Kentner. Happy 22nd birthday to Megan Brooking. Happy 42nd birthday to Dr. Travis Burkett. Happy birthday to Sarah Davis. And happy birthday to Lauren Monaco? Yeah. Monaco? Gotta be Monaco. Spelled like Monaco, but yeah. we'll cut, we'll do both. I think I might know her if it's the one I'm thinking of. I don't know, but we also have a couple late editions. Happy ninth birthday to Adeline Watson. Nice. And happy 19th birthday to Teddy the Bedlam Cat. <laughs> is that cat named after you? Do you know what this is about? I don't. 19 for a cat? 19. They sent a picture, too, of, of Teddy the Bedlam Cat. So The Bedlam Cat. How about you that? You think it's it's got to be named after you, right? The The timeline adds up. Uh, I don't, I, I, perhaps that seems, seems odd, but maybe the bedlam cat. All right. Teddy, the bedlam cat. Happy birthday. <laughs> I like right. cats, but the problem is I'm allergic as hell to cats. I mean, I could walk in a house and if they have a cat, it's instant. I'll, so, I'll tell you uh, this. Uh, and I've told my wife this, uh, this is a dog only household. And my wife's got bad pet allergies, but we got the hypoallergenic dogs mm -hmm. and everything. She doesn't have an issue, but she, same thing. If she walks in somewhere that has a cat, she's miserable. So I've told her that this is a dog only household. And when our kids start trying to get weird pets, lizards, all that stuff, you know, frogs, sorry, daddy's allergic. That's, yeah. that's the go-to. I'm going to be allergic to everything. But a dog, that's yeah. that has been established, and I'm not going to feel bad about it. It's like, oh man, I wish we could get a guinea pig too. Unfortunately, can't do it. I'm a little. It'll kill your dad. Do you yep. do you want me to die? That I mean, that's going to be, that's I'll take it to that level. Like, oh, you want me to die? Really? Okay. It'll be it'll be a decision. It'll be like, I uh, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk a little more bedlam with our man Robert Allen. But first, the only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. 
Loves has over 600 locations in 41 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Loves has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Amare. That coffee is fantastic. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile-to-go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Loves Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Loves Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Loves Travel Stops. For a full list of what Loves has to offer, visit loves.com. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all of the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com and use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. With a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio, no student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. As a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, Contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Remember, financial aid is available. All right, here's a little more on Bedlam with our man, Robert Allen. It is our pleasure to be joined by a man that does so many things for Oklahoma State. There's just, there's too many to list. He is the guy when it comes to information about the Oklahoma State Cowboys football program. Robert Allen is in the house. R.A., how we doing, man? Doing good. Bright sunshine. I, I, we could play here in about an hour, and I'd be all for it. Well, That'd be nice. It, Better than that night kickoff. Yeah, that night kickoff's yeah. going to be a little cold. Not, yep. not as bad for you, Teddy, but for Gabe and I, it'll be a long john evening. Oh, man, it'll be like spring break in Fort Lauderdale for Gabe after last week at West Virginia. It's gonna, it, it can't get worse <laughs> than that. That was uh, hopefully it, right. it won't be it wet. Can. Yeah, okay. it won't it won't be pouring rain. And Robert, now let's start kind of with that. Uh primetime ABC for a bedlam game that has the least sizzle of any bedlam game in recent memory, man. Just what what a weird set of circumstances coming into this football game. It's bizarre. Yeah, when I uh when I saw ABC had selected it for prime time, I was like, is somebody drinking up in New York at the, the ABC sports headquarters? But then, you know, you get reminded of the numbers of this game. Now, I don't expect them to be like they've been, the viewing numbers, but they've been off the chart good. And so I think ABC is banking on the rivalry. I like Gundy's comment. They just want to prove Paul Feinbaum wrong because he said Bedlam doesn't matter. Um, and that, that probably didn't stick in the craw of Oklahoma people as much as it did Oklahoma State people because I think that's the way Feinbaum meant it. But, yeah, I mean, they're, they're banking on the fact that it's kind of got that Civil War Iron Bowl feel and people will tune in to watch even though the records aren't what each team would probably like for them to be. Well, I, I know that uh, kind of regardless of, of how you look at what each team has done coming in, I, I feel like it's going to be a great game. Now, I, I, is, is the outcome maybe as important as some of the previous ones? Perhaps not, but I think it's going to be a great game. And a lot of that really, though, is depending on what it's going to look like uh, health-wise for Oklahoma State. Like, wh what's the situation? How, what do we know about Spencer Sanders? Is he going to go? How healthy is he? What do you know about that situation? Yeah, I think Spencer's really good. I mean, you know, he went uh, the Kansas game where he did not do anything, didn't do anything in practice that week. 
uh, didn't do anything in practice last week other than mental reps. And he was always, he's always been out there, guys. He's always been suited up, which just putting shoulder pads and a practice jersey on. I'm like, really? I mean, if you got a shoulder, and you guys know what it's like to pull those, those practice jerseys and pads off, you can get hurt doing that. In fact, I was in the locker room next to Spencer's locker after the game Saturday when J.W. Walsh and Tim Rattay pulled his shoulder pads and game jersey off. The game jerseys are even tighter. And when they finished, J.W. had a you know look on his face like, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, because you don't want to hurt somebody just pulling the pads off, which can happen. I've seen it happen. And Spencer goes, nah, it feels pretty good. You know, so, uh, yeah, he practiced uh, this week. Uh, I don't know when this podcast will air, when people are listening to it. But, yeah, he's, he's good to go. And like he told the media uh, after the game Saturday, yeah, you couldn't keep me from playing in this game. And, He's really I, – I like it because he's got a decision coming up in the next couple of weeks uh, whether he's going to stay for the COVID super senior year or whether he's going to go to the NFL draft. And I know there's a lot of factors in there for him, but he's a guy that would never opt out. He's not an opt-out kind of guy. And I respect that in this day and time. I understand guys have to make business decisions. But this is a guy that's not going to abandon his team or his teammates. And that's one of the reasons you see him play the way they do. I mean, when he came in at the end of the third quarter, that place went nuts. In the stands, on the sidelines, you could even look over at Iowa State, and they're like, really? He's going to come out here now? And uh, the whole place changed. So, yeah, he's got that, he's got that thing going. He definitely does, and uh, I mean, he is—he is what makes that offense go, Robert. Now, and I know that this is this is probably going to be a complicated answer to this question, but why why can't they run the ball? What what has gone so wrong with you know last year with Jalen Warren? That run game was humming. That was what the offense was based around. And this year, it has. It's been a struggle running in the rock. What what have you seen? Why why can't they run it? Yeah, I think it's a conglomeration of a lot of things. One, I think opponents have gotten very used to and accustomed to Oklahoma State's zone concepts. That's what they've leaned on in the run game. They have not done diversified. They don't run a lot of counter. They don't run a lot of sweep. They don't run ISO power. They're a zone. They've been a zone run team and been relying on it. They've had good backs that, that were really good at, at running zone and making decisions. Dominic Richardson, who's the lead back right now, he just as soon run over somebody as he would run by him or run, you know, look for green and run away from him. That's not the kind of back you want in a zone scheme. Uh, so that's part of it. And, and nothing on Dom. He's a good back. It's just not he's, – he's just not the ideal zone kind of back. Uh, the offensive line's been beat up in some cases. I'm not going to name names. You can go look at the tape, and I don't think it'll take you very long to find it. There's some guys that I just don't think are good enough on the offensive line. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's a disagreement I would have with some of the decisions. And in some cases, they don't have much choice. Uh, unless you want to throw a, a really young lineman out there that might not be ready, but I'm I'm all for a young dog and finding out if he'll bite versus an old dog that ain't biting at all. Uh, if you get my analogy there, um, and then when Spencer is in, when Spencer's a part of this because of his ability, he does make the run game better because on his own read, you know. They're not going to respect, even though both guys are pretty decent runners, they're not going to respect a Garrett Rangel or a Gunnar Gundy like they are Spencer Sanders. A lot of teams spy Spencer. That takes a guy completely out of maybe stopping the run play because they're worried about what Spencer might do with it if he keeps it. So having Spencer back in there will help. 
having the offensive line healthier this week will help. And and we'll see. Although, you know, Oklahoma's got a really good front and they, they do a pretty they've done a pretty good job at times there. So I mean that's just a matchup we'll have to see what happens. What do you think the the protocol is gonna be or the plan is gonna be if Spencer Sanders takes a shot? Uh, on that shoulder, perhaps, or or can't go. Um, is it just as simple as going well, right back to Gundy? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, Garrett Rangel was not completely ready last week. He is now, uh, so that would be a choice that would be made, probably, you know, before you go to the game, obviously, before you're in the game. Uh, and they've been splitting reps in practice with the the second team. Uh, my guess is, I don't know. I mean, my guess would be Rangel because even though he threw, you know, he threw a lot of picks, not all his fault, I thought he was a little more, and again, it's not fair to him either or Gundy because let me tell you, Garrett, Rang, Garrett Rangel gets his first start against Iowa State's defense versus Kansas. I don't have to tell you guys, there's a difference between what he was looking at that day and and what Gunner was looking at last Saturday with with uh, John Haycock's crew. I mean, just look at the different coverages Iowa State runs, and they disguise better. Their windows are tighter. Kansas is a four three four defense that is a little looser. So Garrett had the better deal. In fact, Mike Gundy told his son Gunner, "Well, uh, you picked a hell of a week for you to be the starter because these guys ain't going to give you any breaks, and they don't." They're, they're a heck of a Looking at the the playmakers offensively, Robert, clearly uh, Spencer Sanders is what makes everything go. And you mentioned what he can do with his legs and how dangerous he can be uh, with that aspect of things. But when it comes to the pass catchers this season, who who's really stood out to you? Who's really impressed you? I'm always going to be impressed with John Paul Richardson. I love him. He's a throwback. I know his dad, Bucky. Uh, I mean, he doesn't care when he runs across the middle. He doesn't care what might be there. Doesn't even think about it. Uh, takes big time hits. Pops up. Took a hit against Iowa State. It was a pretty big time hit. Everybody kind of like, he gonna be okay. He just pops up and goes again. Um, so I'm, I'm, I really love JPR. My kind of guy, uh, Brennan Presley. So I just named the two slots. The wide position has been different. I, I'm a big Bryson Green fan. And now you've got Jaden Bray back. And I, I like Jaden Bray. Guys, his history this year broke his thumb in preseason, had surgery on it. Comes back. Everybody thought he might be ready for the Baylor game. Missed that, but was ready the next week for Tech. Played in the Tech game, rebroke the thumb in the first quarter, never said a word. Just played the rest of the game because he told me later, he goes, you know, I was afraid, Mr. Allen, that this was for the season and I just wanted to play out the rest of the game. So he, he, after the game, he goes in the training room, they look at it like, you know, it's twice the size of, of a regular thumb and they're like, oh, God. Well, because he broke it in the exact same spot, it was, I guess, a quicker fix. So he played last week against Iowa State, and he'll be out there this Saturday. Here's the problem. And then you've got uh, Braden Johnson, who's back. Um, so those will be the main threats. Tavon Johnson, Jr., might come along as a freshman. But I, I still rank him behind those veterans, Bryson Green and, and uh, Jaden Bray and, and Braden Johnson. But it's it was harder for Gunner to find those guys against that Iowa State three drop eight and those windows. Look what happened. Spencer came in and boom, one, two, three, four, five. Bryson Green had his first catch of the day. Jaden Bray had a catch. Brennan caught one over the middle. Jaden uh, Jaden Nixon out of the backfield catches the pop pass on the fake run. I mean, Spencer has command of of the the system. And he'll spread the ball around. So when you spread the ball around, everybody's happier. Everybody's more effective. So, again, we go back to 
the guy who stirs the drink and, and Spencer being the straw. Yeah. Uh, that game was, was fascinating. And, you know, you want to talk about complimentary football. That's something Oklahoma's really struggled with. Well, this is like, this is, this is what you need to look for because I could not get anything going offensively, uh, Oklahoma state. And then, Oh, well, you did have the deep pass on the wheel route there, the 83 yarder. But after that, everything was just really difficult to come across. And while you're struggling offensively, defense goes out, forces five turnovers. I, 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 they, they, statistically, not like last year. We all know that. But, you know, opportunistic and, and, you know, taking advantage of some situations seems to be kind of the strong suit of this Oklahoma State defense this year. Yeah, and, you know, they've, Teddy, they've had the same problem the offense has had with a revolving door. Um, you know, Trace Ford only plays four plays in that first half at Kansas. And I really wish Trace had gotten more reps this season because in, in fall camp, I thought he was the best defensive player on the field. Him and Tyler Lacey, and oddly enough, both got hurt at Kansas. Don't know what Tyler's prognosis is I don't, I don't think he'll be I don't think he'll be available Saturday but uh, but Trace is definitely out and um, but what it's done it's opened the door I mean now we, we're seeing more of Cody Walter sheet again who I thought had a pretty good year last year uh, Colin Oliver came alive with and he got more reps against Iowa State uh, you've still got Brock Martin there you've still got the guys inside the guy I'm really excited about that had a good game against Iowa State, and I've been waiting to see him because he, he's the first guy off the bus looking guy, is Nathan Latou. His brother Cameron is a tight end for Alabama. Had a touchdown catch last week against Ole Miss, and on the same day that Nathan recovers the fumble and gets the first sack of his career. So, um, yeah, I mean, he, You've got a lot of guys there. The front has still been fun to watch. Linebacker's been a mixed bag. Mason Cobb gets better every week. Xavier Benson has struggled. But we saw more of the young guy, Nick Martin, last week. And I think he's going to be a really good linebacker. And the secondary kind of got a little solidified last week. Uh, Jabbar Muhammad was able to go back to corner because you had Sean Michael Flanagan back. And he's kind of a steadier back there. He's one of the better tacklers and he's a smart guy that knows where everybody's supposed to be. And of course you got Jason Taylor, the, the ball hawker, and then Kendall Daniels, who's guys, he's going to be a star. I mean, he was the newcomer of the week defensively this week. Every week he gets better. He's got that size. The NFL craves at safety kind of a, uh, you guys remember Steve Atwater with the Broncos? Oh yeah. He's, he's a big he's a big safety talking about Kendall Daniels so uh, you know I think I think the defense and, and that's the other thing you lose Brendan Everett who was out early in the year with another shoulder injury you'll lose Brock Martin but you don't lose really anybody else I guess Jason Taylor but all these young guys the Cam Smith the Raymond guys, uh, you know, Corey Black and Muhammad at, at corners, they're all coming back next year. So there'll be a, a good chance for this defense to roll over and, and be really older and and kind of be hopefully more like what the entire defense was a year ago in 2023. You know, All right, looking, looking at this game on Saturday, and, and I know that, you know, you, you're still going to, dive into some more film as the week goes on, but how do you kind of see this thing going, man? I think it'll be a close game. Uh, I, you know, the, the question about Oklahoma, obviously, you know, they can run the football. And if I'm Jeff Levy, you know, I, if I, you know, he's going to look at the tape of the Kansas game and his eyes are going to light up. He's going, Whoa, ho, 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 wow. Let's just pump it to Eric. You know, I mean, because Devin Neal had him a season that day in Lawrence. And, uh, and it, wasn't, it wasn't just the blocking. There were a lot of missed tackles. That's been a problem at times for Oklahoma State. They've got to tackle sound more like they did against Iowa State. And, again, let's remember, Iowa State's one of the worst run teams in the Big 12. 
I mean, you should have done that. But um, don't have many questions about what OU will try to hang their head on offensively. I mean, I would give it – I'd pump it to Eric Gray. And uh, they, they're not just limited to Eric Gray. They've got other good backs. Um, questions about the center? Because obviously I think he's a, a big key and, you know, left the West Virginia game and whatever his prognosis is. Uh, could make a difference. Um, but defensively, that's where my questions are. I, I'm trying to figure out what the identity of the OU defense is. And maybe they're still kind of looking for it. Uh, I usually pick two games to do deep dives on, trying to find games that might have some similarity to, you know, facing Oklahoma State. And I looked at uh, Texas. I wouldn't look at the game offensively, obviously, but I did look at the defense because I figured there was a lot of pressure on them, and they really became more of a 3-3-5 team against Texas. Now, most of the time, they're they're more, you know, four-man front. Uh, they were against West Virginia. That's the other game I kind of dove into. Uh, against Baylor, I looked at some of that, too, but – that's that's what I think is missing for Oklahoma, and you guys know better than I do because I'm just I'm just scouting. I'm just getting ready for a game Saturday. You guys see them every week, but I just don't think they found their identity on defense yet. the The identity is to play a game plan defense every single week. It's different every week, Robert. Like that's that's the thing that uh, Teddy and I have noticed, and it's it's complicated and complex. And I, I think that's, that's the reason you, you see them have some of the issues that they have is they just don't have the experience. They can't look back and draw from experience. Like, Hey, this is, Hey, remember, this is what we did last year against so-and-so they, they don't have, they don't have that knowledge base quite yet. So yeah, good, good luck trying to find that identity because it's different every week. man. Well, <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know what? Nothing personal, Gabe, but I kind of expected your partner to light up on that one first because it's like, you know, it's like with me. When I see bad tackling, and I, I wasn't, I mean, I, I was a walk-on, okay? I wasn't, you know, I wasn't Teddy Lame and I wasn't Gabe Eichert, you know. Uh, I was I was that guy that wore the other team's jersey and and so forth. But when I see bad tackling and I see bad defensive play, it's very hard, even on the sidelines, it's hard for me to watch. The Kansas game was miserable. I mean, I was miserable watching that. And uh, I can only imagine for for your partner there that there's some times he has to kind of, you know, clench his fist and clench his teeth, you know, watching up there in the booth. Well, I've been worn down a little bit this year. Um <laughs> You know, it was really bad. Or like we started off the season, we looked good defensively. We were doing some really good things, and then it it fell apart. Now they lost all their confidence, and you know, I, I the grind has really got to them. But you know, here's the here's the 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 thing is in pretty much every game, maybe not as much with Baylor, but Kansas State, uh, definitely West Virginia they've played really good defensively for some pretty long periods and offensively special teams just have not been able to help them out at all. It's like every time we force a turnover on defense, we get nothing out of it. We get a three and out or, you know, a turnover on downs. It's just like they've struggled and there's, there's no doubt everyone can see that they've struggled, but like some circumstances and just the way that we haven't played complimentary football has really made things appear to be a lot worse than what they actually are. Sam, complimentary football is, is uh, a, a big term. It's become bigger. And uh, right now there's, and they don't play it every game. They didn't play it really against Oklahoma State, but right now there's really only one team that can, kind of hang their hat and that's TCU honestly they didn't play complimentary football last week at Austin offense took a night off and the defense carried the load so uh complimentary football is, is hard to come by guys 
Yeah, there's no yeah. doubt. It's what every team is chasing, Robert. <laughs> now, we'll see you on Saturday, man. Don't forget your parka, okay? Uh, no, and I've got a pair of, of long johns that I can't wear them indoors because, I, I mean, I literally start looking like Frosty the Snowman. So uh, <laughs> those will be – those 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 heavy-duty long johns will be going on Saturday night when I leave the booth. You're the man. See ya. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, it seems like Robert's expecting a good game too. So we'll see what happens, man. Yep, and he'll have his Frosty the Snowman Long John's on. How about you? Is that your I, plan? I I have got an obnoxiously warm coat that I am I'm definitely breaking out. Yeah, there you so go. over I, prepare. The the hard part is to keep like waist to knee warm. That's the hardest that's the hardest part. Like you can throw on the tall wool socks, like the ankle and foot can easy to take care of. It's hard to find something to keep like waist to the top of the knee. Uh, that that's the that's the biggest issue when it comes to keeping stuff warm. I always freeze in the booth because I'm just sitting there, and my my hands and my feet get so cold because like I'd rather be walking around in it and moving around in it than just dead sitting there doing nothing. So. You're, I gotta figure, maybe I should take like a a little space heater up in there to keep my my feet warm like my wife has. That's that's probably illegal, but that's probably a fire hazard. But I will say I you're going to laugh at the jacket I'm going to wear for sure. <laughs> you're definitely going to laugh. All right, let's let's preview the best games of week 12 in college football. But first, it's football time in Oklahoma, people, and there's nothing better to drink at the tailgate than Clubby Seltzers. Clubby Seltzers is an Oklahoma company that's already winning national awards because their product is delicious. It tastes exactly like a club special, but it's a seltzer. They're not just for tailgating either. They're perfect to drink on the golf course, by the pool after mowing the lawn, whatever. If you haven't tried Clubby Seltzers yet, go grab some. You won't regret it. The variety pack is out. They got some new flavors. They have a new can. If you want to find a place near you that has clubbies, visit clubbyseltzers.com. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, You'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. Week 12 in college football. And before we preview uh, kind of the best games on the slate this week, I just, I don't even know what to say about the Virginia situation, man. Just, um, you know, thoughts, prayers, positive vibes, whatever you want to send their way, just an unbelievably sad and tragic situation there. Their game against against Coastal Carolina has been canceled this weekend. And man, just I, you know, and I, I went through, you know, I know what it's like to lose a te teammate, right? Uh, I know what that's like uh, in college, but. No, not that way, man. Jeez, just a horrible, horrible situation that, I mean, you're worrying about a lot of things as a college football player, man. Uh, you, you really never think that something like that's going to happen. It's it's crazy. It's so sad. Yep. It's the worst. It's one of those things is as, as, a, as a parent, as a coach, as – teammate as a friend uh, all of those things you put yourself in those shoes and just think of how horrible that must be um just totally brutal thinking about those people it's uh 
it's frustrating, sad, all everything all combined in one one emotion. It's it's uh it's tough. Yeah. Not really not an easy way to transition from that, but uh first game that we're gonna look at number four TCU heading to Waco to take on Baylor. This will be eleven AM on Fox. TCU currently a suspicious two and a half point favorite against the Baylor Bears. Trap game is, is uh, yeah. and I, I say trap game, not because they've got a huge game next week, but just coming off that high of beating Texas and Austin. Uh, meanwhile, Baylor got destroyed by Kansas state in Waco. Uh, is that, is that why this spread is as small as it is? I, I'm trying to figure out what the odds makers are thinking here, Ted, because two and a half with, what these two football teams have been up to this point, two and a half makes no sense. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't see much of the Baylor Kansas state game. So I, I don't have much to offer on that, but I know Baylor is much better than, than how they performed against Kansas state. I'm not saying they're better than Kansas state, but they're better than that final score. And I think that shows a little bit here in this spread. Now, if TCU plays their best game and Baylor plays their best game, I think TCU wins it. But you're right. There's factors here. There's TCU, um, you know, coming off of that Texas game. I, as soon as you walk off the field, if you're Sonny Dykes and staff, you look at that Kansas State-Baylor game and you're like, oh, no. Yeah. Couldn't you have at least played it close because – the natural reaction is, you know, for players, oh, Baylor got beat by Kansas State by, you know, four touchdowns. We got this. We're cruising, babe. We're going undefeated. Last thing you want. Because Baylor, as we know, at times can play really good defensively. They get that running game going. They could turn into a dangerous offense as well. So, I mean, I like TCU, but I, it, it it is somewhat of a – like kind of a trap situation, I guess, for TCU. Yeah, like the letdown maybe is a better term for it, yeah. but uh, I know one thing. If the TCU defense that played against Texas shows up, they're going to win comfortably. Yeah. Uh, now, if they let Baylor find some consistency with that running game uh, and, and that allows them to get to some of the play action stuff, that if they allow Blake Shapin to be in comfortable situations, then maybe this game gets a little interesting. But I, I got to imagine Max Duggan, all those weapons that they've got on that TCU offense, they're going to want to bounce back. They did not play well, right? Texas defense got after them. They did not play well. So I, I assume they're going to want to bounce back in a big way after a subpar performance last week. And really, <laughs> I just do not trust Blake shape and to play at a high level against a good football team. I just, yeah. I, I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen enough of it, certainly. So I, that line makes no sense to me. I think TCU is going to roll in that game. I really, I, I really do. But yeah. they, yeah, I think they're getting healthier too, right? Quentin Johnston yeah. has to be feeling better. Uh, another week on that ankle, getting it feeling a little bit better. He finished that Texas game out good and running game still going there for uh, Miller and Demarcado for for TCU. It's a it's a good all around football team right now. Yeah. All right. Next game. The most aesthetically pleasing jersey matchup in all of college football. No, number seven, USC at number 16, UCLA. This will be 7 p.m. on Fox. USC is currently a two-and-a-half-point road favorite. The jerseys. I'm looking forward to it. Like the jerseys, the green grass, right? The, I don't know, what do they call it? Cardinal or red, whatever that red is that USC's got. Versus that powder blue for UCLA. It's... It's gorgeous, man. I don't know how it's good the game's going to be, but the, game. it is it is gorgeous. And one interesting part about this, and it kind of made me laugh out loud, UCLA, they have announced a 70,000-person uh, sellout, right? Because they're taking some of the tarps off. But then I remember it's like, doesn't the Rose Bowl hold 90,000? You can't say it's a sellout when you still have 20,000 seats that could be filled. You can't do that, Ted. That's against the rules. Yeah, that's uh, that's funny. But it's probably going to be the most 
most people that have been there to watch this game between these two opponents in a long time. All right, so uh, I think it's going to be a great matchup. Um, USC has, they've survived, but it feels like some of their flaws have slowly started to be exposed a little bit. Um, UCLA coming off a surprise loss to, to Arizona where they let that quarterback run around all over the place on them. Um, I think it's going to be a great football game. If I had to take a side right now, I'd probably take UCLA, but that performance against Arizona really has me questioning. I'm I'm with you, and it's it's not like oh you're on the road in Tucson. No, 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 that game that game was at the Rose Bowl, and they just kind of really started slow. And if you can't slow down Jaden Delora, good luck with Caleb Williams and what he can do with his mobility and his ability. It's a good practice to- week for Caleb Williams. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding, but I I definitely think points will be scored in this yep. one because you look at each team. I mean, there's just no doubt the weakness of each of these teams is their defenses. And the biggest question for USC for me coming in this game is, okay, how do they handle the loss of Travis Dye? Yeah. Right. And, and I know they have other backs. I understand that. But how much more can Lincoln Riley ask of Caleb Williams? He's already put the offense on his back. Like, do they do they get him more involved in the run game? Do they have another back step up, right? Do do maybe they find some more explosive plays in the passing game as as some of those receivers get a little healthier for him? I, I don't know, but you really can't ask Caleb Williams to do much more than he's already doing. And, and I, for whatever reason, I just feel like UCLA is a more physical team coming into this game. And it has it has a lot to do with the way that Zach Charbonnet runs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's the key for UCLA. If they want to win this football game, Charbonnet's got to have a big day. Now, clearly, DTR factors into what they do on the ground. And he adds to that run game tremendously with his mobility. But Charbonnet, he's going to have to grind some things out. I, I think that you know, keeping keeping the ball, extending drives, right, going on long methodical drives would be a good way to do it for UCLA. And if they can do that, if Charbonnet has a big day, I feel good about them winning the football game, but I think this is going to be a great game, man. And clearly massive implications when it comes to the PAC 12 title race. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is a big one. Um, You know, USC has been able to survive their defense has been giving up a lot of points, a lot of big opportunities. You know, Caleb Williams has done a lot, but, you know, even his numbers, like he's still putting up big numbers, but, um, you know, his completion percentage has dropped a, a bunch and, you know, but, you know, he's he's still so creative out there and, you know, they've got such good weapons that you, this is one of those where you, you can't just like, I, I think they're going to dominate the run game too, UCLA, but USC, they're never going to be out of it. You know, they're they're always going to be like a 70-yard touchdown away from getting themselves right back within one score. Or, you know, if you take the lead on them and there's a minute left, like hold on to your butts because Kayla Williams is going to find a way to get down the field. So I, I wish it wasn't being played the same time we were and it would be able to uh, to watch a little bit more of it. But Maybe we'll catch the end of it. Yeah, hopefully. All right, last game. And if you would have told me you're going to be talking a lot of Pac-12 in mid-November, <laughs> I would have I would have called you a liar. But here we are because number 10 Utah travels to number 12 Oregon. This will be the late game. Pac-12 after dark, 930 Central kick. Oregon is a three-point favorite. I think this is going to be a great game. I just have one question, which seems pretty important. How's Bo Nix feeling? Yeah. What's his status for the game? Is he 75%? Is he 50%? Now, he seems like the type of guy, like kind of like a tough guy that'll play through whatever, right? He's going to play bang, banged up. There's no doubt in my mind, but is it his shoulder? Is it his ankle? What is it? Because if his if his mobility is limited, Ted, That takes quite a bit away from what they do offensively, right? He's involved in the run game. Obviously, he's had some massive scrambles 
this season. He extends drives. He extends plays with his legs. Like if his mobility is limited, I, I feel like that that's huge. I, I mean, that they're just not the same team if he can't run around. No, just go back to that. What that fourth down, you know, last week's game, you know, if he's in there, there there's a, like if he's in there and he's a hundred percent healthy, that play is way more difficult to defend with his ability to run and get those tough short yards too. So yeah, I'm totally with you. Um, just kind of the way he was carrying himself at the end of that game, I feel like he's probably going to be okay, but I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, it's hard to pick. I, I like, I might bias towards Utah cause I really like the way that that team plays typically, but I their think defense, Oregon, their defense is not what it's been. No, right. It's yeah. Not. So that's where, that's where this is. This is like the game of the week that I've gone back and forth on the most like, Oh, right. Hey, Oregon, they're not going to lose two in a row at home. But the Bo Nix factor is clearly like that's a really important talking point coming into the game. Yeah, I don't know. It's fascinating. I lean Oregon since they're at home. I mean, I think it's Oregon minus three. That's basically saying neutral side. It's a pick them. We'll give you the three points for being at home, and, and maybe that's enough to get it done. All I know is this. If Oregon – if they have to turn to Ty Thompson to play quarterback, I don't like the Ducks odds. He yeah. he did not exactly exude confidence in, in those moments last week. And meanwhile, Which is Utah, tough, though, like, like you've got a guy that should be a Heisman candidate, and then all of a sudden you're out there at the end of the game to try and you know you're you're down to Washington. Like, that's a tough spot to be in. Oh yeah, there's no doubt. But on the other side of things, Cam Rising. I, I I trust that guy. He's yeah. he's one of my favorite right. quarterbacks in college football. And that Utah offense, I think one of the important questions going into the game is we saw Washington, right? With, with what Michael Penix and that offense did to Oregon's defense. Like it was the explosive plays in the passing game, right? Pushing it down the field, you know, pushing it down the field on the sidelines, some of those deep throws, that's that's really not what Utah does. Now, I'm not saying they can't connect on those. Rising certainly capable of making all those throws, but it, it kind of feels like Utah's getting back to, hey, let's hand it to Tavion Thomas. Let's run the rock. Uh, rising adds to the run game as well. Let's play physical football. But I think it would be impossible for Utah to watch what Washington did and the sex success they had pushing it down the field and then not try to do some of that stuff. So I'm interested to see how Utah attacks Oregon defensively. How good is uh, Penix at throwing the deep ball? Oh my God. And it, it, I'll just say for, for whatever reason, and it shouldn't be, but like, it's so much prettier because he's left-handed. It looks different. It's just like, God, that's it's, I'll say it's sexy. It's a (laughs) sexy deep ball. It just looks like it was meant to be every time it's in the air because it just hits – he hits him, like, perfectly in stride. It's nice. nice. But Bo Nix, we'll see. But that that should be a good one, too. I kind of kind of lean towards Utah. Like, if you if I had to bet on the game, like, I'd take the points probably. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm expecting a really good game. All right, yep. let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first – First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you are doing. Head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. you got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. 
It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards last, but certainly not least. You got to buy some of Balcony's pot still bourbon. It's big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year round. Remember in 2012, Balcony's single malt won the best in glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcony's products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit balconiesdistilling.com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? I had to go with Taylor Heineke. Yeah. Washington getting the dub. Uh, the last undefeated team in the NFL goes down. Um, I saw the celebrations from the old Dolphins players. Um, impressive, really impressive. Uh, it was cool to see how emotional Ron Rivera was after the game. His mother just passed away. Um, that was really good. And Heineke was, he's fantastic. The dude has, has done a really good job since he's taken over and, you know, they're, I think they're, they're getting some players back off the, off the IR as well. So look out Washington looking okay right now. The commanders. Now, anytime you go on the road and you force four turnovers, and yes, one of them involved just an egregious face mask that was not called. <laughs> Unbelievable that they missed that. But you go on the road, you force four turnovers, you're going to put yourself in really good shape. And the, the time of possession disparity in that game was crazy. Insane. Would they have it for over 40 minutes? Yeah. Two thirds of the game. That's it. I mean, that's insane in the National Football League. And I'll say this Wentz is coming back soon. You can't take Heineke off the field if you're Ron Rivera, right? You got to keep rolling with him. Yes. Yes. And for like, if for no other reason, I, and I don't know the guy, he, he's probably the best guy ever. But for some reason, it feels like Carson Wentz doesn't really galvanize the locker rooms on teams that he's playing for. Right? It seems like everyone hates him. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which, <laughs> like you've never heard. Now, I, I have heard some of his teammates at various stops, like defend him publicly, but not the like. Doesn't seem like there's a ton of passion behind those defense. You right. know, I just, I, for whatever reason, he rubs people the wrong way. I don't, I never met the guy, but yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know. And you know, like you want, you want to play the best guy, obviously, but you also like people play better for guys they like, yeah. you know, like you feel like you, you, you wish in a perfect world, everyone went out and played the exact same, no matter what the circumstances were, no matter what the record was, no matter who you were playing and no matter who's playing quarterback, but stuff like that does factor in. And that team responds to Taylor Heineke. He's three and one as a starter. And you got all kinds of guys are putting chains on him on the plane, on the way home, like putting his, their glasses on. Like I, that stuff matters, man. And yep. uh, you, you, you have to give him a chance to lose the job, if that makes sense, right? Good mojo. Yep. Yeah. He's got some yeah. good mojo. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the week? I had to go with North Carolina. I, you look at the, the college football playoff rankings, and, you know, they're, what, number 13. And I'm not suggesting that they should be in the top four and the top five, but I I just – I know their their strength of schedule is what it is, but I feel like that's a lot of disrespect. They're about to beat Clemson. I think they're going to beat Clemson. So I I'm just I feel like that was uh pretty disrespectful where they've been placed, considering like what their quarterback is doing and the numbers he's putting up that are unbelievable. I feel like they should have been ranked higher. Hey. And the fact that they're being disrespected with those jerseys, that blue, it makes it even worse. No, I hear what you're saying, and I, I think that, you know, they got some opportunities, but uh, Notre Dame, 
we feel like they're a solid team now, but the loss to Marshall, like what, yeah. and the loss to Stanford, just can you put a team in the playoff that lost to a team that lost to Marshall and Stanford? That's no. that's hard to that's hard to reason out if you are the the old playoff committee. That's that's tough. Yeah. No, there's some truth to that. And, you know, as it happens every year, most of this stuff is going to play itself out. But it's, um, I don't know. I I like Drake May. I like North Carolina. I think they're going to do some damage. I think they may, I think they're going to win the ACC. The, the stat line for Drake May, completing 70% of his passes, 3,412 yards, 34 touchdowns, three interceptions. Crazy. And he's, he's also added, the team's leading rusher. Yeah, I was about to say he's added some good stuff on the ground as well. Uh, 584 yards, five touchdowns. Uh, so some quick math tells me he has accounted for 39 touchdowns. Pretty impressive. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that, that is pretty impressive. But If yeah, he's the, on uh, any other team, he's your – Heisman trophy or Heisman uh, favorite right now. I completely agree. All right, let's get to my winner and loser uh, for my winner of the week. I'm going with Tennessee. It's kind of the opposite of your North Carolina argument. I suppose they're sitting real pretty at number five, man. Yep. I mean, you, you look at it, Ohio state, Michigan, still got to play each other. Uh, TCU has an interesting one with Baylor and then still have the big 12 championship game. Looking like that'll be a rematch with a really good Kansas state team. USC may have the toughest road of any of the playoff contenders, right? Uh, with UCLA, Notre Dame, and then a PAC 12 championship game. Uh, Tennessee. I know LSU sitting there, right? And they could mess everything up. They're sitting there at number six now, but I mean, Tennessee beat the hell out of LSU. Yeah. On their own field. Looks better and better, right? It, I mean, Tennessee is, in my opinion, if they went out, they're in and in easily. Um, I think they're in a really, really good spot. I just, and... It's hard to find a scenario in which they wouldn't make it. Like, you can't put... I don't think you could put the loser of Ohio State, Michigan ahead of Tennessee. There's just no way. There, No one's resume is anywhere close to Tennessee's. I agree with that. Um, Tennessee's just – they're going to have way better wins than yeah. whoever loses that Ohio State, Michigan game. and Way better wins and a way better uh, – well, not way better, but a be still a better loss. Right. I, I suppose the – the worst case scenario for Tennessee would be LSU wins the SEC, right? In a really, really close game against Georgia. So you there'd be an argument that both those teams should be in because yeah, that's really the worst case scenario for Tennessee. Yeah. Like they need Georgia to just roll. And and it would suck that I someone may get in over over Tennessee just because you know, they would be the third SEC team. Yeah. Right. That's, you know, that's, that's reality. But, but is there any chance they don't, they wouldn't put the SEC champion in? No. That has There's two zero. losses and lost to Tennessee. I am 100% convinced that if LSU runs the table, beats George in the SEC championship game, not only are they in, they may be the one seed. <laughs> like that's. I agree. I I agree, but that sucks if you're Tennessee. But so if you're Tennessee, this is your worst case scenario, right? LSU beats Georgia in the SEC championship game. TCU goes undefeated, mm -hmm. and USC is able to navigate this three game stretch and be a one loss Pac-12 champ. If that all happens, you're on the outside looking in. It may not. It I. It may only be LSU beating Georgia, like because it, it, like that is, I mean, because the Big be, Ten, like Ohio State or Michigan's in, right, and then you'll have two SEC teams. You got one spot there, 
yeah. for TCU, Tennessee, um, USC, Clemson. I, there's a bunch of spots there. Like that's you are big Georgia fans in the SEC championship. Yeah, that's that's what Tennessee needs is for Georgia to roll. I will say the the fact that the college football playoff rankings show was in between the Kentucky Michigan State basketball game and the Duke Kansas game and, and then the Kentucky Michigan State game went to double overtime. Everyone was so pissed. Like my entire Twitter line, Twitter timeline was like, can we get to the rankings, please? Why am I having to watch college basketball in November? It was that I understand what ESPN is trying to pull off there. In fact, I'm sure a lot of people watch more college basketball than they want to admit. Right. You're just waiting for the rankings, but it was pretty funny how that ended up working out. Yeah. That was just, you know, it's, if anything can happen, it will happen, right? Oh, there's just this one scenario that could throw a wrench in things. Well, get ready. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. Herb Street. Herb Street even like addressed it on, in some of his comments. He was like, I thought they were going to go to triple overtime. It'd be great. <laughs> it was, uh, it was pretty funny. All right. For my loser of the week, I, I, I thought about going with the LA Rams, man. Uh, just season not going well. Three and six, last place. In the NFC West, uh, Stafford, you know, missed the last game in concussion protocol, still is in concussion protocol. And now Cooper Cup having that type tightrope ankle surgery, uh, going to IR, going to be out at least a month. It has not gone well for the defending Super Bowl champs. Said, uh, this is, I I'm sure this is not how Sean McVay saw it going, or maybe it is. Maybe that's why he thought about jumping into the broadcast booth because he maybe saw this coming. It's, it's not going well for the old Rams. No, they geared up for a big run at it, got it done. And it's just natural, man, to have a hangover year after accomplishing everything, right? It's just, it's maybe the hardest thing in sports to do is to, even whenever you may have the best roster, get everyone geared up again for that long grind of a championship uh, a championship season, championship run. So, yeah, it's been tough on them, just mounting injuries, and uh, it's just brutal. Yeah, I also thought about going with Ticketmaster. Um, from what I understand, a lot of people wanted Taylor Swift tickets, and Ticketmaster was not prepared for for what happened. And all I saw for about a – 12 hour period was how much people hate Ticketmaster because they botched the Taylor Swift uh tour ticket situation. I, people were angry, man. I mean, really angry. I thought maybe maybe this is bad that I thought it was funny, but I saw people making fun of the fact that you know, they there was speculation and thought and fears, I guess, that Russia launched missiles into Poland and like the brink on the brink of World War Three. And the number and the thing trending ahead of it was Taylor Swift and Ticketmaster. <laughs> People being more upset about uh not being able to get their early tickets for, for the Taylor Swift uh tour. That was it, I thought that was funny. Yeah, it was uh a lot of angry people. A lot of angry Swifties out there, but my loser of the week, NFL players that don't like playing in the international games. Mm. We got a little more news from the old National Football League. So first of all, the game in Germany looked awesome, right? <laughs> Bunch of rowdy Germans, gigantic beers, like looked like a good time. They got to watch Tom Brady and the Bucks get a win over the Seahawks. And it sounds like the NFL was very pleased with how that one went, Ted. Well, when they had NFL Europe, Germany was really, really big into it. Those, t I think those teams, some of those teams continued to play after the NFL Europe dissolved um, there in Germany. And they had huge followings. And I, it did. It looked awesome. They didn't leave after the game is how awesome it was. They all it, just stayed in the stands and kept drinking. It And they were like running on the field. Yeah. It was, it, it looked like a good time. There's three more years. Uh, left on that contract for the Germany games. So those are going to keep happening. 
So you've got the Germany games, you've got all the London games, which we, I think we've all uh, come to, you know, just gotten used to. And the Cardinals 49ers game, uh, this coming week on Monday Night Football, that game's going to be in Mexico City. So the international games are here, they're staying, and it appears the NFL is interested in adding some more. They have their sights set on France and Spain, Hmm. which an NFL game in Paris wouldn't suck. An NFL game in Barcelona, sign me up. I still think that's the coolest city I've ever been to in the world. But I this is something I didn't know. So according to ESPN, Ted, like, the NFL has divvied up what they call home marketing rights to teams in other countries. So like the Jaguars in, in the UK, right? And that gives you the ability to have what would be labeled as a home game in that country. And try and saturate your brand in that that region. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And I guess the Bears and Dolphins have the rights to Spain. So if you're a Bears or Dolphins fan, like get ready, gear up. You're going, you're going to Barcelona at some point here in the future. I I don't I don't mind it. I think, you know, it's it's just the natural move for the NFL because it's all it's always got to be about growth, right? How are you going to continue to grow your sport and find new revenue pockets and internationally is is where you I mean, say what you want. I, whenever you see the numbers that soccer does and the numbers that like cricket, like there's, there's international sports out there that have like a billion people watch their championship, you know, and I, we don't even know anything about it. And it's kind of how football is. And they're trying to expand that and bring it to more people. So yeah, you're right. Get used to it. Players. You're going to so, be uh logging some miles. Yeah. So uh, Get now pre-prepare your your complaints about the field conditions and how bad the grass is. You know, just get it ready because you're going to need it because those international games, not only are they not going away, there are going to be more and more of them. I would just say that the NFL needs – there needs to be some type of special alert for fans and fantasy – owners to make sure that they have everything set before those 8 30 a.m kickoffs you know it catches a lot of people uh slipping myself included i was about to say that sounds like uh <laughs> there's some personal experience there like my, i want my phone to like go off like the the amber alert thing like whenever there's uh an international nfl game about to be played it's not a bad idea <laughs> Come on, NFL, notify the people. There's there's a lot on the line in some of those fantasy matchups. That's right. That's funny. All right, episode 267 in the books. We'll have a new podcast drop Monday. For the love of God, hopefully we are celebrating Celebratory podcast. Hopefully it is a celebratory podcast. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.